like your answers. All right, we're going to get started with the next panel. Hello, everybody. Uh, you know, the Caps are about to celebrate a big parade here. I think we can be a little bit more excited, right? <laughs> I told people I'm not dressed for the occasion um, today, so I got on the Metro. Um, we want to thank you again for spending your time here at Brookings in this very provocative conversation that we've had all day around artificial intelligence. Uh, my name is Nicole Turner-Lee. I'm a fellow in the Center for Technology Innovation here at Brookings. Um, I have a particular research portfolio of digital inclusion, and I also work on uh, regulatory legislative issues related to uh, AI algorithmic bias as well as automation. So very happy to actually have this conversation um, on the governance side because that's a big part of my portfolio, which is regulatory and legislative policy. Um, we are joined today by three very distinguished people. And I will just do a brief introduction of their name and uh, who they are so we can jump right into the conversation. I think as we become the, the tail end of the entire day, we've got a lot to sort of unpack from the other panels that actually went on today. Um, the Honorable John Delaney is seated right to my left, who is a Democrat from, in the Maryland area uh, at the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you, Congressman, for being here. Uh, Nicholas Maley, did I say that right? Yeah. I, Meow. Yeah, really, really tough one to guess. <laughs> I tried. I'm from yeah. New York. I have a very bad R. <laughs> but I was trying, Nicholas, I tried. Who is the co-founder and president of the Future Society and a senior visiting research fellow at Harvard University, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and Julia Powles, who is a research fellow for the Information Law Institute at New York University. So let's actually give them a round of applause for joining us today. So I've asked all of you to sort of start this conversation with just some general remarks to sort of frame where we're going um, when we look at the legal and policy implications of artificial intelligence. And for those of us that have followed technology issues over the past, this is sort of the new trend, the new emerging technology that in many ways Congressman reminds me of when we started about talking about privacy, when we started talking about even the evolution of the internet. It's this new discussion and when we have new things, we then have to look at the governance question. So I want everybody to sort of start with, is it too early? Do we need a legal and policy framework when we're looking at AI? Congressman, start with you. Okay, well I, I think it's not too early. I think one of the problems that our government has had here in, in the United States is we have not been particularly good at managing change. In other words, change happens. It's driven by the private market. Innovation is extraordinarily positive. But the job of policymakers is to kind of look at how the world is changing and then update the basic institutions in society for that change, which doesn't mean making government bigger or smaller. It just means making it smarter and responsive to how change has occurred. Obviously, technological innovation has been an extraordinary blessing in all of our lives, but it's also created a lot of challenges for specific individuals, 
Uh, it's created additional demands on our education system and our workforce training system. It's created issues around privacy, which Rob is going to talk about significantly in this panel. And the role of policymakers is to try to understand these things and then update these institutions in society. One of the reasons I founded the AI caucus in the House of Representatives was to create a forum for us to actually have these conversations. Our first bill, which is bipartisan, the Future of AI Act, uh, basically has the Department of Commerce do an evaluation of how artificial, artificial intelligence impacts our society. And you know the reason we did this is because it was our view that if you go outside of government, if you go to business, academia, the nonprofit world, they are appropriately obsessed with how this change is affecting everything, and they're doing things to plan for it. The federal government has largely been ignoring change and continues to kind of relitigate battles of the past instead of focusing on the most important thing, which is the future, which is why I think it's mm -hmm. time for us to, to start, mm -hmm. you know, putting in place the framework for this stuff to continue to be a blessing, but make sure it unfolds in a way that makes society more just. That's right. We'll come back to the AI Act, because I want to unpack sure. that a little bit when we look at the various aspects of it. Nicholas, what about you? Well, building upon exactly that, I would like to, again, reinstate the fact that the AI revolution inextricably intertwines opportunities and challenges, mm -hmm. number one. And that's very important to understand, because as a result, the question which is asked to us, and we'll come back to the question of the us, mm -hmm. the we, which is changing. It used to be a very local, right. it's a global one. And the, the previous panels that we've been listening to, uh, you know, have brilliantly exemplified how the, the question of the we is changing from the we of a citizen to the we of a consumer, right. which is not only national, which is global, with interests which are not only frictioning, but at times clashing. That's the, the first point I'd like to make. And the second point I'd like to make, too, is that the, so indeed, it's never too early to start thinking and working on the governance framework of this revolution. Mm -hmm. Why? Let me paint the picture for you. This revolution has been framed by some, especially in Germany from the World Economic Forum, uh, I mean, Switzerland and Germany as nothing less but the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. powered by the rise of artificial intelligence. And the ways in which it differs from previous revolutions, industrial revolutions, is that it's more global, it's more interconnected. So the ways in which we are interdependent right. is very important. And as a result, from my perspective, what, I have, what, what happened in Canada yesterday is problematic. Mm -hmm. The fact that President Macron, for example, is demanding and putting on the table proposals for more collaboration on the governance of AI, not regulation, mm -hmm. no. collaboration, proposing the rise of uh, what we call it IPCC for AI, an internal panel for artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. so that we agree on a strong base of fact, base of matter of fact over what do we mean by artificial intelligence. We've seen this morning how options, definitions diverge, mm -hmm. and what are the dynamics and the consequences. Mm -hmm. And those dynamics and consequences are a new economic paradigm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the velocity and magnitude toward changing, it seems that the, the, the time space at which these revolutions are percolating into society is compressing. And the last point I would make is that, and that's a question through which we can frame the quest for this governance framework. It's not exclusive, it's not a silver bullet, but one of the things that we are working on at uh, the Future Society with IEEE, with various governments around the world, is, is asking the question of what kind of decisions mm -hmm. and how right. should we delegate to mm -hmm. machines? Mm -hmm. Mind you, this remains a social technical system, a complex social technical system, but there is this relationship between humans and machines and, and delegations. What are the principles? What are the values that should drive these, these choices over what we delegate? Mm -hmm. And I come back and, 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 f and finish my point with wh where it began, which is that if the priority of, uh, let's say, Indians mm -hmm. is to expedite the process of development mm -hmm. and provide access to credit and microinsurance to a billion people and the rise of black box algorithm, creates enormous productivity gains to provide access to capital, but at the cost of sacrificing probably privacy, mm -hmm. then we have a question to solve. And that's not an easy one to solve, but that's imperative right. for us to solve it. Okay. Thanks, Nicholas. And we're going to come back to all this. I, my head is <laughs> spinning my notes and writing. Julia, what about you? Um, so I wanted to reflect a little um, from the yeah. two panels we had before, because, you know, one position I have is that I think we're in somewhat of a state of exception about AI. Um, both about the science, I mean, that I appreciated Carolyn's fairly sober definition of what we're talking about here, which is systems that are very good at recognising patterns, very good at classification, 
In a way, it's statistics with a slant. And I think we're affording it this huge scope that we, you know, it's going to solve all of our problems. Mm -hmm. It's excellent at matching, um, you know, a particular query to a particular response. But I don't, I think that sort of across the realm of human endeavor, there's a lot of other tools and techniques in addition <laughs> to statistics that we may want to apply. So I think a bit of a caution about the science itself um, and also about the governance, this idea that AI, you know, sh the question, even this idea of should we ask, you know, should we govern AI? I feel like, well, why shouldn't mm -hmm. we govern AI? Like, mm -hmm. why, is, why should it be exceptional in the realm of science that it, that it doesn't need to be touched mm -hmm. by, um, you know, ordinary rules? And I think that there's already a baseline of rules that apply to um, artificial intelligence around discrimination, around mm -hmm. um, tort liability and so on. And I think that the reason we sort of have some of the debates we do is because there's some bigger dynamics at play that actually are much harder to solve. So there's big questions, I think, about shifts in power. Right. And it's quite difficult to have conversations, I think, about AI without acknowledging that there's huge capital and, you know, new entrants, major technology companies that in many ways are more powerful than states and how you deal with that in, um, in a, a world without boundaries. So... Um, I think I, you know, from it, coming from the academic um, community, I think there's some conversations that sort of are the problems that we can grasp, and then there are bigger challenges that are much more difficult to grasp. So the ones that we can grasp are things around bias, right. which actually is endemic to systems that learn from the past, run a loop on it, and call mm -hmm. it the future. Um, and so maybe we need to say sometimes that is not the right solution to a particular problem. And it, just that ability to sometimes question the technology's application and what mechanisms we have when we have entities that are developing these systems can deploy them in the wild, which unlike in the domain of medical ethics and, mm -hmm. and um, food and drugs and automobiles, doesn't have any precursor right. external um, sort of third party accountability mechanism. I think that sort of provokes really profound questions of governance that are about what sort of preconditions do we want to have to deploying these systems. And maybe reconsidering, I think, say, this conversation about bias, is that actually a way of saying, well, when we think these systems are inevitable, the only thing we can solve is let's make them a little bit more computationally fair, as opposed to saying, well, maybe the inevitability is unfair in itself. Right. Um, so I think some of the levers that we would want to think about are much more profound thinkings of where, where is the value in AI and where is it coming from and could we somehow create different incentives? So... It's a combination of massive data sets, compute power, and I think that technology, for example, has never been more realisable by public interest kind of um, sources. Governments have access to the data, which at the moment, in many cases, they give away um, to those that come with compute power. So thinking about the ways that, um, at the moment, there's no real costs on hoarding data over time and whether we want to have different ways of sort of responding to that with levies, exclusivity periods, um, radical sharing practices. Um, so those are some ideas I think that are outside the kind of usual, mm -hmm. we want transparency, we want trustworthiness, we want you know, non-biased systems. Yeah. So I want to I want to pick up on that. So I'm going to share something that I once heard, um, and I won't reveal the source, but it was interesting about the evolution of technology. Then just sort of unpack what aspect we should be paying attention to, because I think you've laid out, Julia, some of those that sort of streams this conversation. Um, <clears throat> some would say, with technology's evolution, that a lot of the design and technology project products were between the consumer and the pixel, right? So. Video games, I'm not going to say my age, but Atari, Sega Genesis systems, very static, right? Way to actually develop technologies. Then over time, we saw the pixel, the individual, and then the ecology shift, right? Where we actually now see changes in the marketplace, Amazon, companies changing the way that we do business. Now with AI, we're actually seeing societal shifts. So what you talked about in terms of power structures, uh, bias, you know, just evolutionary shifts that are probably more drastic and dramatic that have a global ramifications. This is not an easy place to put governance, right? And, and Congressman, I'll go back to you in this AI bill. You know, when we talked about privacy, there were some statutes that were off the books that we could actually say, well, with online privacy, you know, years ago, when the Obama administration, for example, took it, there's no uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Fair Housing Act. There were things that we could actually look to to define it. With AI, as Julia's point is, we can look at governance of bias. We can look at governance in terms of full deployment. We can look at governance in terms of technical architecture, uh, data sharing, uh, 
it's so many layers. Where should we be spending our time? Because policy often means prescriptive mm. application. Well, I think, first of all, I, I tend to think, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm fairly focused on this topic. AI is, is, is the leader in the Congress on it. But I also don't want to make it seem like this is the only issue we have to deal with in society. So, so I think we have to put this right. in perspective. And we have to think of artificial intelligence, in, in my judgment, as just the next evolution of right. dr dramatic technological innovation that has changed every aspect of our world. So I tend to think of it as across all the aspects and platforms of government, we have to be doing basic updates. Mm. And privacy is probably where I go to first. Now, part of the reasons I, I care so much about privacy is, like most people in the room, is I have children, I have four daughters, and I see what happens to them in the online world, and I see that we haven't done things to protect them and their privacy in the online world, and that's very concerning to me. And, and there's so many obvious examples. If you look at this last election, and, and not to be political about it, but the notion of Russia interfering in our election using social media, the reason they decided to do it using social media is not because they thought traditional media was not effective. Right. Like when I run a political camp, I, campaign, I put ads up on television, I put them on radio, and I put them on the digital platform. The difference is when I put them on radio and television, I have to disclose that I paid for them. When I put them on the digital platform, I don't have to disclose that. So the paid for by John Delaney doesn't have to appear. So the Russians did it on the digital world, not because they thought it was better, but because they didn't have to say who was doing it. And that's such a simple example of government failing to update the basic institutions of society. In other words, a couple decades ago, we decided as a society that it was important for you as voters to understand who paid for political ads. So we required disclosures. But we haven't done that in the digital world, which is so, such an obvious thing we should do. But it's such a simple example. You know, we look at our iPhones, and they turn on automatically now when they see us, which is great. But also, when we see a movie that we like and we smile, it knows that. When our parents call us and we answer the phone and we, the sound of their voice makes us respond in a certain way, it knows that. When it sees a color we don't like, it can see that. And that can all become kind of instantaneous messaging to get us to vote a certain way or buy certain things. And to me, society has a role in that process, right? That doesn't mean we should be putting the toothpaste back in the tube but we should be saying to ourselves as government, which is, okay, we represent the people as it relates to these platforms. What role do we have in making sure they understand what's happening to them and what's happening with their data and that they have some basic structures that give them an opportunity to protect that? And, and right now, the way it's structured, they don't really have that opportunity. So I tend to go there first. That's the area, you know, then there's a, whole, a military application. It's a whole nother discussion that, that I care a lot about. But, but that's kind of where I probably right. prioritize my, my thought process. Yeah, so starting with the updating. So I want to stay on this uh, governance question in terms of what do we focus on and maybe jump right into the privacy piece, GDPR, right? Uh, some of you know that the EU went ahead and passed general data protection um, privacy rules. You know, in, in the European context, all that we're talking about with AI is not necessarily something that they think they have to have, but at the core of it is, and it goes back to Congressman, you've triggered that, right, is privacy is the first step. Um, Julie, I want to point to you first, and then Nicholas jump in. Um, should the United States be looking at a governance structure like GDPR when it comes to AI versus you know, general data protection when it comes to, um, and those of you that are not familiar, the GDPR is basically giving consumers back the ownership of their data. Among others. Yeah. Exactly, right? Among many other things. And many other, well, yeah, other things, putting in governance structures, et cetera. But I always say with AI, as we've spoken about, it's a little bit more difficult, right? Because the human intelligence, the neural reaction, how do you govern that? So I want to start with Julia, then Nicholas jump in. Yeah, so I think that um, what the GDPR offers is a bit of a response to this kind of zeitgeist issue of we're, we're facing a future where there are going to be systems that we don't really understand that will have increasing consequences for life um, options for different people. So what, what it provides, I think the, the challenging aspect of the GDPR and the 25-year framework that it builds on is very strict um, regulation and control of all flows of data. And that, in many ways, and anyone who's looked at copyright, it's a similar thing. Like at foundation, it doesn't really work for the internet age in that we, that sort of level of control is difficult. In practice, it's enforced in a kind of 
well, somewhat ad hoc fashion, but it tries to focus on where there's more harm and you can trace then, then what the implications should be. So I think at the level of, I think most people have some instincts that, are, that align with what data protection offers, okay. which is that when information about you is processed, that you should know about it, that you should have some ability to see how it's used, you should have opportunities to contest it, um, if it's wrong or if it's out of date um, and it doesn't meaningfully reflect you. So those sorts of rights, I think, are ones that are common. And in fact, here the US is the exception. Right. There's over 100 countries around the world that have a system like the European system. And what it particularly offers in the case of AI, I think, is um, strong prohibitions on sort of data hoarding mm -hmm. and also on purpose limitation right. so that you can't say, well, we have this massive stack of data, which is what a lot of companies are doing. We have this information. What can we, maybe we can throw some different AI systems at it and we can get some value. So from a data protection perspective, that's very problematic. And what it translates down to is at the individual level that there's sort of rights to contest. I think what's difficult is privacy is something that is more of a collective value than an individual one. And I think that the, it, it puts a lot of weight on individual shoulders to understand, to agitate for how they should be protected and so on. So I think perhaps more um, what the opportunity is in the US is to think more in terms of what the what values we want um, more widely. And for example, this situation that the Congressman um, stated about sort of facial recognition right. systems that are just appearing. I don't know that if we polled 100 people on the street that they would all like the fact that those systems are collecting that and could be used for any number mm -hmm. of purposes. Um, and the kind of complete absence of prohibitions in that sort of space is really, really problematic. Yeah. Nick, let's jump in on there, because you're right, there's so many other things, but AI and GDPR, just as we just look at governance, and sort of combine that with the US context. Well, there is so much to say, but okay, <laughs> well, I'll start there maybe. The implication of looking at GDPR as a way to govern the rights of AI is the fact, which I think is right, to look at from a tactical perspective, to look at the governance of AI through the data mm -hmm. angle. As you said, and as you have emphasized, the rise of AI does not exist in a vacuum, does not happen in a vacuum. It is part and it is a manifestation of the wider digital revolution, right. which is delivered through new economic models mm -hmm. of the online platform of the data economy and increasingly right. the attention economy, whereby <laughs> or attention wingspan becomes the product. Mm -hmm. You know, we are the product, but when we dig into what is the we in that product, these are functions which are or behaviors or transactions or ability to point our attention and increasingly productive factors of our attention. When we educate uh, facial recognition, deep neural networks of Facebook by tagging those pictures, right. what is bought from us is a bit more productivity than what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So in that context, I think that the right angle to approach is indeed the data. And the key hope and bet, let's be clear, it's a bet. Right. And it's a bet with risks implied because the Europeans are regulating from a position of extreme industrial weakness, <laughs> extreme industrial weakness. And so they're creating, creating the conditions whereby leading, leading actors in Europe were not very much digitized, are not acquainted with those, those new business models, mm -hmm. and growing te tech giants in the US, for example, will have the financial wherewithers and the, I would say, organizational strength to adapt. Mm -hmm. and to adapt and comply with that regulation. Those who could suffer are small innovators. Yes. It's mm -hmm. a bit like net neutrality. Yeah. Those who suffer are the small, those who can't pay, mm -hmm. because that's a barrier, that's a payment, that's a fee to pay at the end of the day. So we are, as Europeans, because I'm French, we are aware of that. Mm -hmm. The big bet that we're making is that we want to plant a stake to create a digital market which is based on trust. Mm -hmm. Trust that in that framework, which I described before, over what kind of delegations we delegate to machines and the ways in which those delegations are based on data, the ways in which we entrust data for certain uses to those companies is regulated right. in terms of consent, in terms of portability of right. data, and so many other things. The implications are the following. Right. Europeans want to leverage their 500 million consumers integrated, not sufficiently, but integrated digital market to send a message to the uh, multinationals. And it's no surprise that Facebook, Microsoft, IBM have said and declared all publicly, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that they consider the extra extraterritorial uh, impact of GDPR as potentially something beneficial, that GDPR could become right. a global 
gold standard. Mm -hmm. And because we have so much in common in terms of values across the Atlantic, the transatlantic partnership around these values can be enormously, enormously constructive in how we define the global right. gold standard. So, I mean, Congress, I don't know if you want to jump on in this because this part, yeah, and then no. we move on. But um, what do you think? I mean, in the U.S., it was Clinton and Gore that decided in the U.S. to sort of, uh, you know, make the Internet much more of a capital exchange. We give our data in exchange to getting something free. We believe in the U.S. in a two-tiered marketplace, right? That changes. European, I mean, the GDPR came in a perfect storm, <laughs> which is why yeah. I think it has so well, much Well, but the world changes. Right. Right. So, I mean, look, at I, I tend to think it's incredibly important that we not bring t too much ideology to this debate, right? So if you listen carefully, you'll hear kind of two arguments around this discussion. One group of people saying, don't stifle innovation. Anything the government does stifles innovation. Well, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, obviously, I, I believe in a free market capitalistic system. We want to make sure the innovation is based here in the United States of America and that we are the leaders in the world. That's incredibly important to our competitors. No disrespect to your country, but as a, a representative of the United States, I want to win in the technology of the future, and I want it to be in the United States of America. So I don't want to hamper innovation, but that doesn't mean we can't put in place certain protections for our consumers. Mm -hmm. Similarly, some people see anything that moves and they want to regulate it. And that's a bad outcome. So I think we got to be very balanced about this. We, again, I keep coming back. The world changes, and part of the government's job is to update the basic institutions of society for that change. Change is generally very positive. I think the other thing that's dangerous in these discussions are all these, you know, doomsdayers. You know, the Elon Musks of the world who are predicting the end of the world based on this stuff. First of all, they have no ability to predict that. Just because he's been successful at building electric cars, and I applaud him, that doesn't mean he has any better insight into how the future mm -hmm. of this is going to unfold than anyone else. Generally speaking, history teaches us that innovation is extraordinarily positive for the condition of humankind. I think this will be that way as well. But that doesn't mean there's not a role for government to kind of update institutions to protect our citizens, ensure that our country wins in this next age of innovation, and importantly, that we prepare our workforce, that they have the skills they need to be able to get jobs and succeed in the world as it will change based on these systems. So I want to go back then, and, and, and we'll soon take a couple of questions from the audience, but I want to go back, though, to this conversation. Then, So where, do, where should government come in? Um, and I want to sort of reflect back on Julia's question of bias and the work that I'm doing here at Brookings and uh, Daryl and I sort of and kick the can on, which is, you know, to many respects, facial recognition does have disparate impact. It has different disparate treatment, and it contributes to uh, an equity. Um, in many effects, it has disparity effects, we call it, you know, where... Um, the facial recognition, or let's just go with uh, the algorithms and the AI that's used for predicting bail and sentencing and incarceration has baked in bias where African Americans, for example, regardless of how smart the science is, they still uh, tend to be incarcerated longer because the training data, and you said it earlier, is not necessarily academic. It's sort of rooted at the bottom line. Um, countless cases where we've seen um, face app, uh, photoshopping apps based on European models that basically uh, oppress or so credit score stacking, etc. Is that the place where government should start looking at protected classes? Um, Nicholas, you said something. In many respects, if you're not online, you're actually online because those investments that are driven by AI are not coming to your community. When we look at that, I'd just like to ask all of you, is that a, a place where we actually can get some consensus that governance is probably well needed to ensure that we don't create a massive divide that we worked really hard to have technology not do, which is to help people solve problems, not help people become poorer and healthier and uneducated, you know, as a result of, of their lack of access to it. Anybody? Well, I would just say three words, privacy, transparency, disclosure, mm -hmm. right? The government has a role in making sure that privacy is protected that there's disclosure in how things are programmed, recognizing you gotta protect certain intellectual property that so the people understand, right. and kind of transparency right. around actually what the user experience is really all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think those different examples you said of facial recognition are really interesting. Themselves. As an outsider to the US system, I can look at the criminal justice system and see all sorts of problems. 
Um, but I think most, for any of these sort of algorithmic systems that build on top of what we've already done in criminal justice, the key challenge is we don't really have very good or any data about crime. We have a lot of data about policing. And so the more that policing, which we know to have all of these endemic issues, is refined to keep doing what we've been doing, it's going to perpetuate, I think, a very unequal state of affairs. With solving systems, this sort of idea that we don't want facial recognition systems that can't capture minorities and other groups, I think the challenge there for those who work on these technologies in industry and in academia, where a lot of the policing work happens, right. is that there can be really perverse outcomes in making the systems equal and fair. And I think what's very striking to me is that the sort of whole conversation about bias and fairness takes this very formalistic idea that, like, if we all treat everybody the same, then it'll somehow be fair. But, I mean, I actually would celebrate systems that don't capture a proportion of society, and maybe we should say, therefore, they're not very good, and we don't want to use them for this particular application. Because in the process of making, you know, solving this great fight of computational fairness, we create this, these systems of, I think, ubiquitous surveillance, which have all sorts of other consequences. Um, and it's just a sort of very problematic direction. I think there's, what, what's challenging is that because we don't have very good systems for regulating when a, a particular application of technology is desirable, like we do want people mm. to be subject to, you know, have some metrics around mm. um, credit that are transparent right. and, and applied equally, but around policing, it may be different. And mm. so an ability to, to actually regulate use, um, which we haven't really proven, I think if, until we can prove that we could regulate that, I think we do need to do more at the collection level of data. Um, and so a lot of these systems, there's a real question about whether we should be using them at all. Right. Um, and yeah, I'm just a bit wary about some of the fight for, for solving bias as a way of just entrenching systems that then have later consequences for transparency and accountability. And I just wanted to say one thing about transparency, which hasn't really come up, but um, there's a there's this sort of real clash where um, there's a corporate secrecy around um, automated systems and AI ha really has sort of narrowed the scope for regulation to actually even understand. I think we had comments in both this morning's panels about how important it is to understand what systems are doing. Um, so I think there's a, an opportunity for regulation that, that restricts in the same way as we have under freedom of information laws, mm -hmm. the proper scope of defences of trade secrecy in response to, and you can have partial transparency in all sorts of options in, in order to allow those who are um, our elected representatives to actually understand the systems right. that are being used. Yeah. Nicholas, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I think that one thing which is very important, I think that the case of, uh, algorithmic bias is a great case in point to approach and attack the question of governance of AI, articulating the very sh long term super intelligence versus the ultra short term. Right. In a way, we're asking the same questions. In a way, in solving that problem right, including globally or at least transnationally, we are laying the foundation for solving the next problems. And it's not, in my view, never too early to think about the bigger problem. I don't think that thinking and preparing for super intelligence which is an act of conviction, not, not an act of science, right. is worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that because if the velocity and magnitude of the rise of AI is such that the current trend continues, we might, for the first time in human history, have to worry vis-a-vis uh, -vis this kind of magnitude of problems. Mm -hmm. But I think that the best way to do that, to appease the uh, short-term, uh, very legitimate concerns, is to look at what we have now and the algorithmic accountability and governance is a great case in point. That's right. To address that, I think that one way we need to go about that is try and be very smart. But what does it mean by that? One way in which we are generally not too smart, and the we in that case are communities seen at large in societies, is to look at sequencing of regulation. Mm -hmm. One is it that we need to shift from a laissez-faire position to a forward guidance position to a hardcore regulation, number one. Number two, how is the fact that, and that's my personal view, or the view that we develop at the, uh, the future society, that the rise of AI, because of the global dissymmetric oligopoly mm -hmm. that it's unfolding it, causes, in a way, corporate governance, uh, public governance, mm -hmm. and technical governance to merge. Mm -hmm. So, in many ways, the work that engineering communities are doing right now mm -hmm. to standardize and to define standards and design principle of measurability of competence, of accountability, of transparency, and so on and so forth, 
represent sites of governance. Yes. And it's very important that they are, and those sites of governance are enhanced, uh, recognized, and supported. Yes. And as the same wave is of the corporate governance, the ways in which big multinationals are asking the question, in most ways, in very sincere terms, in, in trying to look at this problem, initially from a corporate social responsibility, mm -hmm. and now increasingly from a corporate governance perspective, okay. I think is a very good thing. And one thing which I heard this morning, which is that we need more and more of these kind of dialogues, I think which I totally agree with, I would qualify a bit, bit, a bit more what we mean by dialogue. Mm -hmm. Let's not be afraid of it. We're talking, in a way, in the most noble way, we're talking politics. <laughs> yeah. mm. And we're talking <laughs> politics with the right kind of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to and not be afraid to approach that question and not find, in a way, fall in the trap of this, which is ongoing, uh, which is this paradigm of a global race for AI. It's happening, yeah. and therefore it's very important to be able to upgrade the quality and the volume of these conversations at a global level without crushing very local identities and problems involved in that. Because yeah. the question of AI ethics in this country, in the case of the Loomis case, for example, in access to justice, is not at all the same of the case of, uh, as I said before, an Indian farmer's demand to get access to micro, micro insurance. That's right. Do you want to respond, Congressman, or any on this before? Okay. I mean, I, I think uh, just to kind of stay on the three points that you all made, I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge with AI when it does come to governance. Uh, the paper that we're working on, and I, and I sort of like Nicholas way you framed it, we've done uh, conversations here in Washington, D.C., where it's mostly policy people who are like, we don't like the output, you know, it's because it creates this disparate impact, this disparate treatment. It's not enough of a sample. We go out to Bay Area and they said, but we like the formula. <laughs> the computation works. This is what people are telling us that they're doing online through their tags, and we're using that natural resource of big data to come up with these assumptions not realizing that it's the inferences that come from um, this activity on the web that creates you know, what the policymakers are seeing. And so I think you're right. Corporations are coming up with their own governance. Data um, engineers are coming up with their own governance. Policymakers are coming up with their own governance. And at some point, and I'll go back to you, Congressman, policymakers are all about protecting consumer trust, uh, you know, the public interest. I'll ask the question I always want to ask, and since you're standing here, I feel like I've got all these people as my witness that you won't throw an apple at me. But are legislators really ready to deal with this topic? Um, well, no, I think it's a big problem. I think, I think we saw in the Facebook t testimony with the Senate right. that there wasn't a lot of technological literacy um, represented. So that's a, that's a core problem. But that's manageable, because we've had that problem before. And ultimately, policymakers guided by smart people who are interested in good public policy, help them get there. But, but it has to come, see, I think there is a little bit of a top-down approach that's needed here, which is what this country needs, the United States of America needs, is a national strategy around artificial intelligence. And it should have kind of four components to it. The first and most important component to it is what we do to protect our citizens and our consumers. And we've talked a lot about that with respect to privacy and data. There's a basic level of consumer protections, a bill of rights, if you will, for our, for our consumers, as it relates to what they should expect their government to do to kind of intermediate between themselves and the technology companies so that they're protected. That's the first thing. The second thing that the country needs to do is basically look at kind of the business opportunity available to our nation from a competitiveness standpoint and make sure we're making the right investments in basic research so that we continue to develop the cutting edge technology here in this country and it becomes commercialized in ways that create jobs here. So there needs to be a kind of a competitiveness angle. The third aspect to a national artificial intelligence strategy would look at the future of work and look at how these technologies will disrupt the workforce. They'll create jobs, they'll disrupt jobs, are we actually educating people and training people so that they have the skills they need to get jobs in this future. And then the fourth aspect would be as it relates to our security, both our homeland security and our foreign policy defense strategy, which is the, con the conventional advantages the United States of America enjoys militarily can be equalized very quickly with kind of powerful technological systems that rogue actors uh, and terrorist organizations can use. Have we, in fact, hardened our military and our national security for these systems? So a national artificial intelligence strategy, in my judgment, would have those four components to it. And if we articulated that without specific regulations, but articulated goals, what we should be seeking as a country, 
then it seems to me it would be a lot easier for the legislative branch to actually do its job and work with experts, et cetera, and go through the legislative process to put in place things to make those kind of that strategy That's come right. into being. But we don't have that. We don't have that, in part because of ideology. Right? Some people say, no, 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 there's no role for government in this. And other people are like, yeah, the government's got to be doing everything, right? And, and that's it, like a lot of issues we have in this country. Instead of solutions, we get gridlock. Right. And that's a problem as it relates to the future, because unless you prepare for the future, you um, don't benefit from it as much as you could. That's right. Congressman, I hate to do this shameless pug, but uh, Daryl West has a book that talks a little bit about ideology. Uh, yeah, I know your Brookings just came out. Uh, if you haven't read this book, you have to read this One book. Th so, so John, no, but I, I've got to read the book. But John F. Kennedy in 1958, four weeks after Sputnik was launched, when the country was terrified about us losing our leadership position, gave a speech in Baltimore, Maryland, where he said, we shouldn't seek the Democratic answer, we shouldn't seek the Republican answer, we should seek the right answer and we should own our responsibility for the future. That's what we need as it relates to technology. This isn't a Democrat or Republican issue. Right. This is an issue for all Americans, and we ought to be doing the right thing to prepare ourselves yeah. for the future. Yeah, that, Daryl, you were forecasting <laughs> on that one. I want to give the last two panelists just an opportunity to speak on, you know, again, we've heard uh, the production of a national strategy, particularly that applies to the U.S. Nicholas, you've talked about global. Do you see something more global in terms of a framework and, and where we go with this? I certainly see an ongoing race for artificial intelligence for very legitimate and good reasons, which is to capture the upsides, productivity gains, power. So it's a question of power and sovereignty, and therefore the fact that there are very legitimate national techno strategies which compete with each other mm -hmm. because they correspond to communities of interests, communities of values, communities in practice, which are not yet harmonized, creates the condition for destabilization not only from a military perspective, but also because, like we've said before, I keep on coming back at this example of the Indian farmers vis-a-vis -vis the, the, let's say, the American or the uh, European consumer. These frictions, this, this lack of harmonization creates tension and probable uh, destabilization or ongoing destabilization. All work, and one other thing that we do is we work with several organizations, including, for example, uh, the government of the UAE, which has appointed a very young minister, state minister for artificial intelligence, which wants to work on laying the foundation for a global uh, governance framework, basically. And that starts, and we should not shy away from that, that starts at the point of discussing where do we have common grounds in terms of values. And more often than we think, because we are going through a wave of convergence, we are going through a wave of uh, globalization, we can find common grounds. So it's about finding those common grounds in terms of the, those values and translating those common grounds in terms of design principles, mm -hmm. norms, codes of conduct, mm -hmm. codes of practice, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And every effort that go in that direction, in my view, are very constructive. Mm -hmm. There are some of them, and that's why I come back to what, as an example, the French president right. suggested two months ago, which is to start by creating an IPCC for AI, to come together as a global community to start agreeing on what do we mean by AI, what are the dynamics, and what are the consequences. Right. Right. And I think we have several presidents, right, when it comes to international governance, you know, cross-border data flows, all of the data portability. We've been around this conversation before, you know, in many respects. I think you're right that there's this local governance that is very much pertinent to the country. And then there's this opportunity to do more collaborative work and sharing, which comes up with best practices as a repository of values. Julia, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Now, I want to hear from people, but I, just one, um, I think it's a very compelling sort of uh, comprehensive strategy. I think it'll all depend on the interrelationship between the first and second part. And often what happens in the piece about how you get the innovation is that all of the parts about cons protecting the public sort of falls by the wayside. And right. I think the real one, that's, it, in, in my view, a sort of a, a real rethinking of the data economy and the opportunities right. that exist for, to me, it's not that innovative to let companies that are sitting on hordes of data and are incumbents to just keep monetizing it however they can. And there's ways of thinking about those assets um, that could really spur a lot more innovation and competition. And I think that demanding that the innovation proceed in a principled manner isn't, isn't to stop it, it's to save it. So, yeah. Yeah, this has been a valuable conversation. I'm going to open it up for questions. So uh, I will recognize you. Why don't we start this way, and then we'll, we'll go here to this young lady, and then we'll come over to you. Uh-huh. 
Uh, my name is Melissa Cataldo. I'm a student at California State University, Long Beach, currently working with Storm King Analytics. Um, so my question is, we've talked about how AI is used to detect patterns and therefore make decisions. So with the extensive future applications of the technology, especially with automation, how do we decide or program ethically debatable decisions within the new advances? Are we capable of determining which decisions should be systemically programmed without bias? And do we establish these determinations through governance or through what methods would we use? Mm -hmm. Anybody want to take that question? Go ahead. Thanks. I can take a first crack at that. Well, one, one way to look at that is really to understand what is this big data-driven, machine learning-centric, mm -hmm. algorithmic-centric tool um, system that is AI today. T today, when we talk about AI, we talk about essentially not only that, but essentially that. It means that there is a convergence between big data, growing computing capabilities, and those old, but now high-performing, um, let's say, machine learning techniques, including deep neural nets. So looking at how we can extract more accountability and explainability from these, um, I would say, system, is not only a question of open data. Of course, we need to be able to see the kind of data and data sets which are used to train these algorithms. Right. But increasingly, because the, the computing is done at the core of the hardware, we need to also have more open hardware. So for, what, for example, when large multinationals, like Google, not to quote them, talk about TensorFlow as an open architecture, which I think is great, I think it's not only a question of understanding the ways in which the algorithm operates. If we want to govern well, we need to go to better understand the type of data that have gone into that. Right. Um, I think it's, it's, so it's a question of what kind of data, what kind of computing hardware has been used, and what kind of algorithmic architecture has been used. And moving from there into a conversation where we look at what are the values that we have, what are the tensions between access and protecting privacy, protecting dignity, due process. These tensions and the ways in which communities and countries look at them are important to go towards the right kind of solution. But there is no, and there won't be any silver bullet. In That's my right. view. Mm -hmm. and, and the private sector should understand that unless there's transparency around how these things are, how these things are done, that it won't ultimately play out well for them, right? Citizens will reject it. And let me just give you one example. Warren Buffett tells a good story. He owns a company called Geico, which is the largest auto insurance company in the world. And he was asked, well, people aren't going to need auto insurance anymore because we're going to have driverless cars and there'll be no accidents. So how's that going to be for Geico? And he said, well, let me tell you the issue with that question. And he said, it'll happen. We have the technology. But he said, imagine a driverless car is driving down a road. And approaching it is a car driven by a human being with two passengers in it. And the person driving that car has a heart attack. And the, that car swerves towards the driverless car. On the side of the road, on the sidewalk, is a five-year-old girl riding her bicycle. So the driverless car has to make a decision. Does it hit the, the car that's coming towards it, which is the person had a heart attack and it has two passengers? Or does it veer and run over the little girl on her bicycle? And someone's going to program that car to make that decision. And his point is, society cares a lot about that decision. Mm -hmm. And unless society understands completely how that decision was made and who programmed it, it will never be comfortable with it. And that's why when we talk about transparency and the programming of this stuff, it's not only something that we should care about as citizens, but I tell people in the private sector all the time, you should care about this. Because unless people ultimately feel comfortable with this stuff, they may you know, not realize it's happening for a while, but once they realize the implication of some of these decisions, they're going to want to know who made them, and they're going to freeze everything until right. they get to the answer of that. So uh, just if I can just chime in on your question, they need to hire more sociologists at <laughs> these companies because they clearly don't have enough people that understand the world context to actually help with some of that. Um, we'll go here, and then we'll go here. Um, I want to thank the panel for a very good discussion. Uh, my name is Elliot Hurwitz. I used to work at the World Bank, the State Department, and in the intelligence community. Congressman, um, I thought I heard you say that the, the uh, U.S. government has largely been ignoring change. Um, would, you include, would you include in that the um, Department of Defense and the intelligence community? 
Well, look, and I think the Department of Defense um, has obviously been making very significant technological investments, right, because that's what it does. But in general, largely because of our preoccupation with a lot of wars in the Middle East, I don't think we have been kind of resetting our military from a technological standpoint as fast as we could have. What's not being done, Mr. Mann? They have not been ignoring or they have not been ignoring change. Mm -hmm. No. I didn't I mean look at I didn't say every single person within every department. The US government's obviously a big enterprise. I think in general we have not been good at managing change as a nation. And our policymakers have not been forward looking at where the world is going and preparing our country for that. Yeah, I, and I would say on that, sir, too, um, you know, you look at the military and their use and uh, deployment of artificial intelligence and the internet has been much longer than what we're talking about in terms of this commercial market. I think the challenge is it goes back to the election piece that we're used to sort of looking at people playing by the books. <laughs> So when you look at the Russian election interference, you know, there was, it, it, it almost was like the worst case of voter suppression because no one was going to the Supreme Court to say, hey, wait a minute, they just target all these ads to vulnerable populations. Right. And so there's we, a different strategy. We haven't hardened our electric grid. <laughs> yeah, haven't, yeah. Right? Yeah. And our, that's a homeland security issue. issue. <laughs> that to me is a country not planning for the future yeah. because if I was a rogue actor, those that's are the right. kind of things I would be focused on. That's right. And have we done that? No. That's and that right. actually cost about six or $10 billion to harden the grid in this country. That's, right. That's actually not that big of an investment relative to, this, to the no. cost, cost of something happening. Yeah. So, Sarah, right here. Can I oh, something? sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to, to add something to this point in terms of the relationship between the markets and governments in fostering the rise of new and fresh techno-scientific cycles. Right. In the history of the digital, governments have been the main purveyor of the, of the kind of long-term, patient, high-risk, capital that has enabled the rise of the internet, DARPA, the rise of GPS, yeah, DARPA, sure. and we could continue on and on and on and on and on. So citizens <coughs> have had, have and will have a yeah. key role to play in driving those techno-scientific right. cycles. But the difference is that the ways in which those uh, techno-scientific revolutions percolate into society through innovation is at this point right. led by private companies, which right. innovate on the basis of taxpayer money delivered to foster the rise of new techno-scientific cycles. Mm -hmm. and, and thereafter, when those innovations percolate through the market right. at scale uh, in all societies, then it creates challenges of adaptation. Right. But, but, I, but to the defense of the private sector, I think what we actually saw with the growth of the internet becoming more transactional versus static are these opportunities, which is very much part of how the internet ecology has grown for these new startups, right? So I think your question is right. It's the extent, I mean, even if you look at the Telecommunications Act of 1934, we weren't anticipating the growth of these types of companies. There was nobody thinking that information was going to be a transactional um, um, a commodity. Wouldn't but it be nice if it said 2018 <laughs> after that? Right, exactly, exactly. And that's the point, right? And so I think to your point, I think we have to sit back and say, all of society has been impacted by some type of um, industrialization. This is the next wave of it. I think this conversation is very relevant and timely because then we have to figure out what's the proper foundation to actually make it work. And that's where the updating of laws. My point is in funding highly disruptive, yeah. uh, early techno scientific uh, innovation, the government, which plays its role, yeah. in my view, should pay much higher attention to what we call second and third order consequences. Yeah, that's true. That's the true. case of DARPA is a great case. It's a case, point. right. Immense talent, immense long-term vision, and a true and sincere, and sincere demand to go slightly beyond national security as what drives us right. and look at second order and third order, order consequences so that when self-driving cars right. percolate into society and deliver major revolution, these consequences have been anticipated because those cycles are long. That's right. They are right. That's at right. least 10 years, if not 20 to 25 years. I see another panel coming up, Daryl, on this. So we're not done yet here at Brookings in this conversation, but you're completely right. So we got to invite you all back. Okay. Uh, no, we can take one more question. We've got, or, sir, please, please ask your question. We should question. let Julia answer because she's the smartest person right. on the stage. Somebody, so. did you want to ask? Okay. We have one more question in the back. Uh, if you can, there's a gentleman. Raise your hand. We'll go to the gentleman in the way back, and then we'll come to the gentleman a little bit forward. And I think the last question will be this gentleman over here. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you. It's a very interesting panel. I actually worked for Delaney Campaign 2012, so it was a pleasant surprise. I was going to ask about larger, about the question of a large monopoly, and that Amazon owns 
not only owns a large part of the web services that drive a lot of websites, but also owns, um, but I mean, also has fingers in Whole Foods and the Washington Post. And that's just one example. I mean, Google has a whole host of, of companies, or rather, Alpha has a whole host of companies un, under it as well. And you have these huge data silos, mm -hmm. and they, and even if one were to have some sensible worth list legislation that would allow portable data, where would it go? Mm -hmm. Can you address the issue a little more? Thank okay. you. So I think, uh, do you all understand the question? I think the question is, would you raise one? We talked about, I heard the competition word come up here on the panel. Monopoly, sort of like looking at the competition. I mean, Amazon actually just uh, was reported was selling some of their algorithms. I don't know if some of you follow that. But if you can answer that question um, in terms of market competition concentration and how this actually sort of plays into the data silo stuff. Yeah, well, I think it's very telling that actually the most progressive thinking in how to deal with tech is in competition, which has traditionally been the kind of a backstop um, <laughs> when you have to reach for antitrust. Um, but antitrust has a few issues that I think uh, haven't really adapted well. One is just that when you don't discriminate on price, but you have massive data sets and data hoarding that you then can use to offer greater advantages that are free, um, there's, it's really not a very easy thing for antitrust to grip on. Um, there's some excellent work I'd refer you to Alan Grunas, yeah. Maurice Stuckey, um, Frank Pasquale have written a lot about, um, about the implications. Lena Khan here in DC on Amazon. Uh, so th this is, I think, where it, there's a real opportunity. I think that here the US can really lead. Um, there's been some, this sort of a latent latent Sorry. feeling about um, Google and so on, but what, what we do about Amazon and the sort of AI rise and some of the acquisitions that have been problematic in retrospect around right. like the WhatsApp acquisition by Facebook and so on, um, I think will be crucial in the AI age. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think this is a really important area of policy. So what I want to do is I want to take this question, the second question, if you both will hear both, and then if you all can sort of answer that, with a closing comment. So this one and then the gentleman back there. Oh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. I, I think I'll direct this to Julia. Um, actually, just around the corner last night, General Hayden said, the existing systems, AI systems, understand you now better than you understand yourself. yourself. And that's now. We don't have to wait for super intelligence. And those existing systems are getting better. So the problem is, and, and by the way, it's not just because I click on certain things on the internet that it understands me better. It's because it has big data on the whole population and it can compare me to people who are similar to me and come to conclusions. So it's the big data plus the algorithms. So the, uh, how, how do you propose to address the danger that when you have systems that understand me and everybody else in the population better than we understand ourselves, that opens a possibility of manipulation of the population on a scale that's never been conceived of before. Uh, so, you know, how would one prevent that? Uh, would it be a legal issue or how? And so hold that question, Julia, and we'll just get to the last gentleman there, and we'll uh, have you all summarize your responses. Hello, Jesse Wu, Alita Consulting. Um, so in 2014, Professor Ryan Kahlo published um, in Brookings uh, an essay calling for a federal robotics commission. Um, this would just be an advisory group. It wouldn't have rulemaking authority, but it would situate expertise on AI and robotics in the federal government. And so I'm curious what you think about that. That was, you know, four years ago. Uh, have we reached, are, are we sort of beyond the point where that kind of light touch, just have an advisory committee mm -hmm. is useful or is, is that a, a useful thing still? Okay. So, Julia, we'll go back to you answering that first question. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's really important to disentangle. And a lot of the stories we tell about AI dictate, I think, what future it will have. And if I, I'm sure, Stephen, you believe that, as, you know, I don't know you, and a system may know an approximation, a derivative version of you based on your activities. And if we, I think, build systems that define how we navigate the world and how decisions about us are made that depend on all the information about everybody else, then we will live that sort of future and it will be, I think, a pretty dystopic one. But if we understand what is th th truly the case, that I think that human autonomy is a real thing and that systems that... Th but, th but the architecture of the world 
around us has, we have this interplay. And so I think that the, this is exactly why we're at a point, and I think there's a tremendous opportunity with sort of connection of AI with the Internet of Things, more animated objects in our environment that do dictate our physical behaviours as much as our digital ones, to say, I don't, want to, I don't want these systems that I can't see that are run by, you know, just trying to serve me more advertising and um, enable greater transactions and consumer surplus to be actually having a fundamental impact on my autonomy. So I think that is the challenge. There's some excellent recent scholarship I can send you on um, the sort of manipulation scale problem. Um, but I, I think that th there's still this opportunity for us to say, well, that's, that is the derivative version of me based on everyone else is not me. Um, and I don't want the world that is defined by it. Mm -hmm. So I'll pose that last question to Nicholas and the Congressman you have the last word, which is um, around light touch. Uh, the gentleman's question, should we go back to light touch, multi-stakeholder process? Are we seeing a uh, pattern here that we should maybe be, from this conversation, avoiding, very prescriptive, and really start with the conversation to get to an end point on the policy and legal implications? That still won't, because they're connected to address your questions uh -huh. here, which is that, that's why I'm talking about the new social contract. These systems do not know you better than you do. They are reconstituting a new you. You lay down digital traces, only traces, and they do not reflect the complexity, the intensity, the granularity of your true self. Mm -hmm. Those digital traces then get algorithmically projected to create new solutions. And that's why, indeed, the rise of AI and algorithms inextricably connects opportunities and challenges. Because the ways in which this new self appears to you and society pose new challenges. And the asymmetry of power through which this new self emerge is potentially problematic. So it's not uh, yourself, it's a new self in my view. And connecting with the, the other question, well, from a US-centric perspective, I personally miss a lot the Office of Technological Assessment, <laughs> which is this office that is supposed to create a bipartisan, strong base of matter of fact, based on which legitimate political discussions can happen. And I'm a bit weary of, in a way, trying to find a fix, meaning an uh, administrative independent authority, where we need to get to the meat of a very important conversation. That's, that's where I'm a bit, uh, I think we need that, but I would rather see first the right kind of conversation brought back where democracy is to be played in this country. You know, you know, Congress. <laughs> but that's my view. Congressman? Well, I think it depends on the issue. I think on privacy, we need to be doing some things right now. I don't think we need advisory commissions anymore. I mean, I think the toothpaste is out of the tube on some of this stuff, and there's some real stuff we should be doing. I talked about one simple example, which is requiring disclosure on political advertising. I think doing things to give consumers more protection on their data. This is real stuff we could do now, updating the Telecommunications Act, right? These are real things we could be doing now. On things like robotics, I still think on that issue, I don't think there's any legislative solutions for robotics right now, right? But I do think it'd be important for the Congress of the United States, where I serve, to be thinking about the impact that these things are going to have on the future of work mm -hmm. and making sure then we are designing our educational and workforce training systems, et cetera, so that people can get the skills they need to have jobs in the future economy. So I, I do think it cuts across... Um, you know, what we should do, again, th this stuff affects every aspect of our lives. In some aspects of government, we're woefully behind and we should act now. Others, we're probably still in the phase of trying to figure out where the world is going and doing some policy things that are somewhat indirect. I mean, robotics, there's not like laws you pass to limit the number of robots that can be in factories, but you do think about how you educate your, your kids and what kind of career and technical training people should be able to get and how they pay for it and what's part of the basic social compact. Mm -hmm. I use compact, not contract. <laughs> um, in society so that people get the skills they need uh, to get a job. I mean, right now we're graduating um, a lot of our kids from high school and they don't have either the ability to continue their education or the ability to get a job. I mean, two-thirds of the kids who graduate high school in the United States of America are not eligible for our military because of deficiencies in hard and soft skills. Yep. There's an example of clearly a public education system that's not preparing people 
for the future of work as it will change with robotics. I think having commissions there to actually make us smarter to, to make some of those changes, I think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say this, thank you uh, for your panel. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, I want to continue to also stress, you know, here at Brookings and dare I see with your book, if I can actually just, <laughs> you've got, we're looking at this stuff. And I think in particular, we're, we're looking at this intersection that came out most profoundly in this panel, which is, you know, the good of AI, precision medicine, education, other decision making, along with the balance of its effect on the economy and competition, but also on people. And so keep following us. We've got papers. We've got books coming out of Congressman. We thank you. Nicholas, we thank you. And Julia, we thank you. We thank all of you for giving us your time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.